We are so thankful that you have made the choice to tune in for one of ACC's messages. You know, as you're listening and diving into the truths that are being shared, we challenge you. If you're sitting at your phone or at your computer, hop on social media and be sure to use the hashtag, you belong at ACC, as God is teaching you different things during this message. You belong at ACC and we truly mean that, which means that we would love to have you join us during one of our Sunday services at 9 or 11 a.m. here at 710 Aqua Heart Road. We would love to have you jump into this message and we are believing God is going to do some awesome things in your life today. Good morning, church. How's everyone doing today? What's up, everyone watching in, in the lounge today or watching online? Just want to say hello. I didn't get a month off like Pastor Matt did for sabbatical, but I did get just get back from uh, vacation. I spent a few days at Great Wolf Lodge with my family, which that was incredible. Uh, and then I spent a few days just at home kind of hanging out and, and just being away and resting. But I'm excited to be back. If we have not had a chance to meet yet, my name is Mike Miller. I am one of the executive pastors here on staff at ACC, and I am ready to have a good time with this tough question. Are you all ready today? Awesome. Let me ask you this question real quick because we have some empty seats. So I'm going to ask you, do you all like the people you're sitting next to? If not, you can shift over a little bit. I give you permission. We're going to have a good time. We're, like Pastor Matt said, we're going to be asking the question, is it ever okay to do wrong to do right? Is it ever okay to do the wrong thing for the right reason? or maybe for the right thing to take place. And that question alone, it's a, it's a tough one. It makes me squirm a bit because really I just want to give a one-word answer and do like a mic drop or something. But I don't have a microphone in my hand, so I can't drop a microphone. So uh, we're going get to get right into the message and get right into the Word. You know, a couple weeks ago we answered the question, how do we know the Bible is true? And based on what we discovered together, I think the, uh, the best place to start probably is the Word of God. Amen. So let's turn in your Bibles if you have it today. If you don't have one, there is one in the, in the seat in front of you. Let's turn to 1 John chapter 4, starting in verse 4. And this is what it says. It says, But you belong to God, my dear children. You have already won a victory over those people, because the Spirit who lives in you is greater than the Spirit who lives in the world. Those people belong to this world, so they speak from the world's point of view, and the world listens to them. But we belong to God, and those who know God listen to us. If, we, if they do not belong to God, they don't listen to us. This is how we know if someone has the spirit of truth or the spirit of deception. Dear friends, let us continue to love one another, for love comes from God. Anyone who loves is a child of God and knows God, but anyone who does not Love does not know God, for God is love. God showed how much he loved us by sending his one and only son into the world so that we might have eternal life through him. This is real love, not that we loved God, but that he loved us and sent his son as a sacrifice to take away our sins. Church, let's pray. Holy Spirit, we ask, Lord, that you would help us to know real love through the truth of your word. We love you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Well, you know, when I think about this question, is it ever okay to do wrong to do right? Ultimately, the first thing that I think many of you probably thought, or some of you at least, at least to the first part of the question is, you know, is it ever okay to do wrong? You probably thought, no, it's not okay to do wrong. It's probably the first thing that popped in some of your heads. Uh, you should always do the right thing, right? I, I think it's a lesson that we teach our kids a lot of times. We teach them to always do the right things, at least until they're old enough to fully understand and make their own decisions. But then we get to the second part of that question, and it made me think, at least, whenever I, I looked at this question several times, probably a few hundred times before I even started to write this message and even pray about it, I just, I just sat there reading the question over and over again, and I started to think, maybe... I, maybe some people don't truly understand what right or wrong is. And so, you know, you, you, maybe, maybe there are things that are wrong, but they lead to what's right, or vice versa. Maybe there are things that are right that lead to what's wrong. And always do the right thing doesn't seem so easy to really just comprehend or understand at that point, at, at this time. While I agree that, that we should do the right thing, what if the right thing turns out to hurt more people? 
Or what if the right thing was right for you, but for others it was wrong? What if the right thing from the world's point of view was bad or illegal? You know, there's, there, there's other questions that go, just think about, let's, let's think back to the book of Exodus real quick. In the book of Exodus, we read a story about uh, Moses. He, he was talking to his father-in-law, Jethro, not Jethro Gibbs. Anyone watch NCIS? I don't know this Jethro's last name. I just know that his name means overflow, and that's pretty much all I know about him. But Jethro gave some advice to Moses, some wisdom to him, and he, he basically said, this is how you manage the disputes and the needs and the issues that come along with leading all the people you're leading. And he, he led him, what, what the, the advice led him to Mount Sinai, right? And so while he was on Mount Sinai, the Lord spoke to him and gave him some instructions for all of his people. We know them today, and in the Bible, it, it even labels it, at, in all, all the translations, it labels them as the Ten Commandments. You know, a few of those commandments that you'd probably uh, would think about immediately are things like, thou shalt not kill, thou shalt not commit adultery, thou shalt not steal, thou shalt not bear false witness against thy neighbor. Notice I went King James Version on y'all. Anyone else grow up with King James Version learning the Ten Commandments? These are, these are the, the, some of the more common Ten Commandments that you tend to think about right away. And I think a lot of them, generally speaking, could be easy to follow, right? The like majority of the people would have no problem not killing. The majority of the people would have no problem deciding not to steal. Although a lot of us, I think, we, uh, we tend to steal things without realizing it. How, how many of you have taken a pen home from work or like a staple, stapler or something? Even some people take like whole reams of paper home for their printer. That's stealing too, by the way. But I'd hope every person in here would have no problem living on the side or at least trying their best to live on the side of holiness rather than giving in to lust and committing adultery. You know, what if, let me ask you this, this tough question. What if a person who you just chose to let by you without doing something to intervene or shoot at maybe or hurt or harm somehow or potentially even kill because that would be the wrong thing, what if that person now has just walked into a school with guns and obvious ill intent and has now killed dozens of kids and teachers? What if the person who broke into your house to steal, as you turn the other cheek to be like Christ, gets violent for whatever reason and does harm to your wife, to your kids, to you, maybe? You know, those are some quite extreme examples, so let's think of some, some, some that are a little uh, less extreme, a little lighter. What if you have to lie in order to keep someone else safe? Or, or lie in order to not break the law, like in regards to HIPAA or other job-related requirements? What if telling the truth to someone is the best thing in the moment, but in the end it ends up being more hurtful to that person or even to an entire family? Or potentially gossiping about someone because in the moment it makes you feel good and it makes, it makes you think that your friends like you more because of what you're saying, but really it just causes chaos and destruction in not just their lives, but your own life in the end. And everybody knows who the gossip is in church, right? Even in your jobs and stuff. Everyone, it's really obvious when those people are around. But I think men have a great way of, of uh, kind of dispelling all of this and getting around all, to kind of solve all of these questions. Men, we call it the bro code, right? Men, do, do you ever break the bro code? The men in the room? The, do none of the men in the room know what the bro code is? So the next series, we're going to have to change. It's bro code 101. We're going to make that a growth course. All right. So is it ever okay to do wrong to do right? Before we can truly answer this question, I think it's an, it's, there's an important stance that we have to align our hearts with. And I want you to listen, listen carefully to this. You know what? I went to the eye doctor recently. Um, I've been a lot in my life, and I have a really weird case. But every time I've been there since I can remember, I've been told that my situation with my eyes is not something that can be easily solved or really solved at all. They can't really help me. They tell me maybe in a few years as technology changes, we can do something, but right now we can't. Uh, so they tell me, here's a small portion of your prescription but really, we just need you to wear glasses at all times to protect your eyes. And all my life, I was like, Psh, I'm not doing that. I'm not going to wear glasses. But 
They said, wear a prescription to help with strain and fatigue. You know, just, just to, mainly we just need to prevent injury because if you lose your left eye, if you don't know, my right eye is almost blind, so my left eye is pretty much all I've got. So if I lose my left eye, if I hurt it, I'm in big trouble. I won't be able to drive, I won't be able to do anything, I won't be able to hunt, maybe fish, but it'd be all an instinct, like feel, you know, I don't know, that'd be weird. But what I've noticed since I've got these particular glasses, these are my more recent glasses, is that the colors don't quite look the same. Because I, I, I got a, a, on top of the prescription, I got a blue light lens, right? To help with strain from being on computers and devices and stuff all day. But when I take them off, I can see the true colors. At least what my eyes perceive to be the true colors. But knowing the trouble that I have with my eyes, I know that I'm not really seeing colors the way they truly look. And in the same regard, people in the world are looking through a different lens at the world around them than we should be looking at through or looking through as believers. People in the world are looking through a different lens at the world around them than we should be looking through as believers. Notice I said believers. I didn't say Christians. There's a difference. A believer is a follower of Christ at all costs. A follower of Christ, a Christian tends to come and go based on what's convenient. And I don't know about you, I'd rather be a believer, a follower, known as a follower of Christ, than to be a go-with-the-flow kind of Christian that leaves when they disagree and comes back when the dust settles. How many of you would rather be a believer? The way that we look around, at the world around us shouldn't be the same as people who are not followers of Christ. Because secular worldviews are based all, are birthed from the heart of Satan. Secular worldviews are birthed from the heart of Satan. But a biblical worldview is birthed from the heart of God. Let me say it this way. The world looks through the lens of darkness, but God looks through the lens of light. Church, we should be looking through the lens of light if we were to be followers of Christ. And if you're looking through the right lens, the colors will be obvious, the colors will be clear. If we try and figure out what is right versus wrong based on the world around us, we'll always be aligning ourselves with evil, with corruption, with darkness, with hate, with sin, with wickedness, with shame. But if we look to God for what is right versus wrong, we'll align ourselves with hope, with love, with joy. With the fruit of the Spirit, we'll align ourselves with, with what is holy and what is righteous. We'll align ourselves with truth and light. Let me show you a story from, from the book of Mark. In Mark 2, verses 23, starting at verse 23, it says, One Sabbath day he was walking through a field of ripe grain. As his disciples made a path, they pulled off heads of grain. The Pharisees told on them to Jesus, Look, your disciples are breaking the Sabbath rules. And I don't care who you are. These guys are annoying. Pharisees, man, they're... Uh, you ever heard snitches get stitches? Yeah. Man. The Pharisees told on them to Jesus. And Jesus said, really? By the way, when, when, you read, when I read the Bible, I try my best. When I read the Bible, when I see an exclamation mark or a question mark, I try to read it the way that they were probably talking or probably writing it. And so you have to put it, you know, make it come to life. So read it with some enthusiasm. So Jesus was sitting there and he goes, Really? Haven't you ever read what David did when he was hungry, along with those who were, in, who were with him? How he entered the sanctuary and ate fresh bread off the altar with the chief priest with a weird name right there watching? <laughs> Holy bread that, was, that, that no one but priests were allowed to eat and handed it out to his companions. And then Jesus said this, the Sabbath was made to serve us. We weren't, we weren't made to serve the Sabbath. And it's like a mic drop moment right there. The son of man is no yes man to the Sabbath. He's in charge. Church, what we see here is a group of people looking through the world's lens and Jesus giving them a prescription check. The Sabbath, in the Pharisees' eyes, was a prescription of, of law, not of love. But Jesus said the Sabbath was made to serve us. We weren't made to serve the Sabbath. He put them in check. I think it was a, a really cool thing. It's a prime example of the way that the world thinks, really. They think, how can we manipulate this to make it better for us and make you stumble? It's the way the world tends to think. I think many of us in this room probably need a prescription check as well. I'll say it to you like this. If your prescription is good by the standards of culture, chances are it's bad by the standards of God. If your prescription is good by the standards of culture, chances are it's bad by the standards of God. 
Jesus brought it back to the foundation when he, when he responded to them, talking about serving and about loving. You know, from God's perspective, serving, by the way, is a form of loving. You know, if you, if you really read the scriptures, you, can, you will find out that you, you'll find that you can never be more like Jesus than when you serve. And he spent his life on earth serving us. And God, in all of his goodness, out of his love for us, served us by giving us a Sabbath so we can rest. I think that's a beautiful thing. Love is the greatest command of all. We're going to explore more of that later because God is love like we read earlier. I want to read to you again and remind you really what, what 1 John 4 says because a lot of people tend to look at ethics and moral principles based on emotions and their worldly experience, but they forget really what the Bible says. Uh, how many of you have caught yourself looking through what the world is saying versus actually paying attention to what the Bible says in that moment that, that something is kind of hard or tough? Uh, you know, my first year of college, I, I went to school for my very first year um, at AACC. I have to say it slower because ACC, AACC. So Anne Arundel Community College, I went there for one year and then I screwed around and got in trouble and all kinds of stuff. But my very first year of college, I remember my very first science class that I registered for, I, I was like, all right, I dislike science, so this is going to be fun. So I walked across the school campus. I got there. I remember sitting down in the room going, I, I'm just going to be the introverted side of me and sit down and ignore everybody. So I was sitting there and the professor comes in and he opens up the class and he proceeds to tell everybody, by the end of this class, you will believe in evolution and you will disagree with creationism. And he, and he would not listen to anybody else. And he told us, if you do not believe in evolution, you will fail. He refused to hear anyone else's worldview. He refused to hear anyone else's argument. He tried to force his beliefs on us. And I remember feeling a sense of darkness kind of looming in the room. And this professor had decided that based on what he believed, the way that he saw the world, that everyone else's minds and hearts should fall in line with his. He had determined that his worldview was right. Well, people tend to look at, at the world's definition of morality which distinguishes right and wrong or good and bad based on the world's standards, on cultural standards. But the culture of the world is tainted by the lives of Satan. And everywhere that you look, he's infiltrated hearts and minds with evil. So you can't look at it like that. Everywhere you look, you see people trying to use position and authority to get others to bend to their ideology. That's our culture today. Unfortunately, that's what we're born into. That's what we're born into when we're born into this world. We're born into a sinful nature. So we need to put on biblical glasses or a biblical lens and look at the world through the lens of Christ. You know, people today oftentimes base their choice of what is right versus wrong based on the color of their political party. Even Christians. Notice I said Christians that time. I didn't say believers. People are voting for candidates based off who stand for unbiblical ideas and ideologies based solely off of what party they associate themselves to, rather than looking through the biblical filter or biblical lens for what is right and for what is godly. Church, morality is not and should not ever be based off of what you see through the lens of darkness or the lens of blue versus red or political party and, and all these different agendas, you need to take those glasses off and look through the lens of Christ and realize that morality is the revelation of God's purpose and his divine gift. Morality is based on love. It's, it's based on a command to love God and love people. The Bible says in 1 John 4, remember I read this to you earlier, you belong to God. You don't belong to Satan. You are a child of God. You've been bought with the ransom. The price has been paid in full. You have already won a victory, the Bible says, because greater is he that is in you than he that is in the world. And we know what love is when we know God because God is love, right? We, we need the world to know God. We need people around us to know God so that they can know love. That is the only way our world will ever know what is truly wrong versus right or what is right versus wrong. What is right, I'm here to tell you today, love is always what is right. Love is always what is right. That's point number one. Actually, it's my one and only point today is love is always right. I'm going to read to you a, a story or some pa a passage from Matthew 22, starting in verse 36. It says, Teacher, 
which is the most important commandment in the law of Moses? And Jesus replied, you must love the Lord your God with all your heart, all your soul, and all your mind. This is the first and greatest commandment. A second is equally important. Love your neighbors as yourself. Love is always what is right. Jesus was quoting the scripture to us from, from the, you know, the Old Testament scripture, right? He, he put it in this order when he quoted it for a reason. Oftentimes I think that we, for, we've, you know, when we read the Bible, we don't realize that Jesus puts things in, orders, in, in order in a lot of the statements that he makes. In fact, the writers from the Bible did the same thing. As they were writing, God gave them a specific order to put things in as he was speaking to them, and they wrote it down in that order for a reason. I'm not talking about like the actual books of the Bible. We know that some of them are chronologically out of order when you open up your Bible, but I'm talking about the actual scriptures that were, that were written in the Bible. Love, loving God comes first. That's why it was written that way, because God is love. Loving people comes second. And the thing about it is that if you love God, you'll naturally love people you'll automatically be loving people because it says in 1 John 4, 20, if someone says, I love God, but hates a fellow believer, that person is a liar. For if we don't love people we can see, how can we love God whom we cannot see? And I want to point out something else about love as well. You know, when we talk, a lot, uh, when we talk about love, we oftentimes pair it off or talk about humility as well. And I think, personally, I think that humility is one of the most important topics covered in the Bible. Not the most important, not the most, but it is an important topic. Um, and, and, you know, whenever I think about humility, I tend to think about selfishness. I put them two together oftentimes in my own head. Selfishness is a terrible thing. Selfishness, uh, just in general, let me put it like this. You are not here on this earth for your purpose. God put you here for his purpose. Selfishness will ruin any attempt for you to show the love of God towards people. It'll also deter people from any desire to be in relationship with you. Therefore, you can no longer minister to them. You can no longer tell them your story. You can no longer show them the love of Christ because they don't want anything to do with you. It'll deter people. It'll put a bad taste in people's mouth about you. However, self-love is biblical. Self-love and selfishness are not the same thing. Remember it said in Matthew 22, verse 39, love your neighbors as yourself. So I want you to remember this. You were made in God's image and God loves you. And if God loves you, why shouldn't you love yourself? I look at it like this. God was sitting back and he goes, probably sitting there going, if he used our kind of language at all, like, dang, I'm awesome. I love me. You know, he's probably thinking, let me make a bunch of mini me so they can love themselves too. Self-love is the basis for loving others. Jesus didn't say, love me instead of yourself. He said, or, or love others instead of yourself. He said to love others the way that you naturally would in your own natural human state, the way that you are built to love yourself, love others that way. And at the same time, our human sinful nature tend, tends to get prideful way too easy. Pride is, it, oh man, we have to humble ourselves in every area of our life. We have to. You know, pride doesn't make you look better to your peers or to your, to your coworkers or to your friends and people around you. It makes you look better to Satan. Pride leads to destruction, the Bible says. And oftentimes we mistake pride for confidence, and they are not the same thing at all. So when you're in a situation, when you're trying to figure out what, is, what the right thing to do is, or what the right, and, and, and maybe in that situation, the right, what seems right in the end may seem wrong in that very moment, you have to first think these, these two things to yourself. Am I loving God with this decision or action? And then am I loving the people involved and the people affected with this decision or this action? And I know not every situation is that easy to figure out. Many times we, we kind of find ourselves in like a gray area. You, you stuck right in the middle, you know, in our natural eyes. And when this is the case, love for God comes first. That's why it was written that way in the Bible. Love for God comes first. It takes priority. And if it happens to be that God provides a way to accommodate both, where you get to love him and you get to love others, then that's, that makes it easy for us and we can be thankful for that. But that's not always the case. That's not always the case. I want to tell you this. Love is never caught on the horns of a dilemma. Each command is an absolute command that stands alone, on its own. But God has a priority every single time. And when you're loving others, it's important to remember this. Love without truth isn't love. It's hypocrisy. Tr uh, truth 
without love is nothing less than cruelty. But in all of it, grace is a must. Truth, love, and grace all need to coexist together in every situation. And you know what? You cannot love someone, by the way, by affirming their beliefs just to avoid conflict. That's not love at all. That's agreement. That's agreement. Today's culture has skewed the definition of love, and that's why it can be super hard, sometimes impossible, what feels like impossible, to define what is right. But did you know everyone loves love when they get to define it? But the Bible says God is love. So God is the only one who gets to define what love is. In 1 Corinthians 13, 6, it says, Love does not rejoice about injustice, but rejoices whenever the truth wins out. Hmm. Love rejoices with truth, not injustice. So we might as well make sure the world knows the truth and stop saying, oh, they just need love. They just need love. Truth is the primary ingredient in love because God is both truth and love. Truth, truth isn't a, a philosophy or an ideology. Truth is a person. In church, his name is Jesus. The Bible says that we're to be salt and light. I've heard this argument a lot. You know, you're supposed to be salt and light to the world, so you always have to love them and, you know, show them the love of God, and, and that's it. Absolutely. We're created to show the love of God. However, did you, have you ever gotten like a sore in your mouth and then the old wives tells tells you put salt on it? Or like got a cut and then went into the ocean to swim? Salt hurts when it touches an open wound, doesn't it? In the same way, truth hurts when it touches an open wound. You have to pair the two together. Hillary Ferrer, you ever heard of Hillary Ferrer? She's the author of Mama Bear. It's a book written for mothers. Yes, I did read them. I want to know what the ladies are being taught. But she said this in one of her books. She said, what you tolerate today, you accept tomorrow. What you accept today, you embrace tomorrow, and what you embrace today, you promote tomorrow. And I think it's time for believers to stand and embrace and promote truth with love, not one without the other. And we need to stop tolerating, accepting, and embracing the lies of the enemy before we start promoting those lies as if it's the good news. We need to stop tolerating, accepting, embracing, and promoting the world's culture and start to promote the kingdom culture. The culture of the kingdom of God. I know at times it can be hard to figure out the, through these different scenarios that you hear about in today's culture. Church, I'm here to tell you, God is the ultimate baseline for what is good and what is, and what is right, for what is righteous. He's the father of light, the author of life, the absolute measure of goodness. The word of God is the criteria of measuring what's right versus what's wrong. So you don't have to figure it out on your own. You don't. And you might be thinking, how on earth, how on earth am I supposed to know what to do in every situation, the very moment that it's happening. I'll tell you this, the only way that you can know that is if you live your life looking through the lens of Christ. And the only way that you can live your life looking through the, through the lens of Christ is if you know him and you know his word. And the only way to know him and know his word is to be in his word. Because he, in this book, you will find his personality, you'll find his thoughts, you'll find his character. The Bible says in Psalms 119, Verses 105, your word is a lamp to guide my feet and a light for my path. So this book, the Bible, the truth, the true, authoritative, absolute, spoken word of God is a guide for your life. And you're probably thinking, man, there's, there's just so many pages, so many words. I wonder how many, I'm curious now how many words are in the average translation. Not the message, that would be way too many. But you might be thinking, there's so many pages. How, how can I know everything that's in here? You don't, you don't even have to. Listen, as you grow closer to God and allow him to speak to you, the Holy Spirit will guide you. It says this in, in Galatians 5.16. It says, so I say, let the Holy Spirit guide your lives. Then you won't be doing what your sinful nature craves. The sinful nature wants to do evil, which is just the opposite of what the Spirit wants. And the Spirit gives us desires that are opposite of what the sinful nature's desire. These two forces are constantly fighting each other. So we see spiritual warfare happening. So you are not free to carry out your good intentions, but when you are directed by the Spirit, you are not under the obligation of the law of Moses. So we see here the priority of loving God first is key, 
Because it says, essentially, if you are under the direction of the Holy Spirit, you're not under the obligation of the law. Now, that does not mean you can go out and do something wrong or immoral or illegal or unethical and blame it on the Holy Spirit. Don't do that at all, because Christians already get labeled as cuckoo because of cuckoo people that do stuff like that. We, that's not what this is saying. Galatians 5.25 says, Since we are living by the Spirit, let us follow the Spirit's leading in every part of our life. Let's go back to verse 19 real quick. I'm a, I, want, I want you to see this. It says in verse 19, When you follow the, the desires of your sinful nature, the results are very clear. And he lists it out. Check out this list. It says sexual immorality, impurity, lustful pleasures, idolatry, sorcery, hostility, quarreling, jealousy, outbursts of anger, selfish ambition, dissension, division, envy, drunkenness, wild parties, and other sins like these. So he puts on the etc. because the list continues. Let me tell you again, as I have before, that anyone living that sort of life will not inherit the kingdom of God. And here's where it gets good. But the Holy Spirit produces this kind of fruit in our lives. Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. There is no law against these things. Those who belong to Christ Jesus have nailed their pas- the passions and desires of their sinful nature to his cross and crucified them there. Since we are living by the Spirit, let us follow the Spirit's leading in every part of our lives. So we have clear direction here that the Holy Spirit will guide you through what is godly and what is righteous versus what is evil and what is wrong. If you are following the Holy Spirit's leading, when the time comes, you'll know exactly what is truly right. When the Spirit guides you, you know it's God's plan and not your own. You know, there's a story in the, in the book of Luke where Jesus, Jesus was chilling. I said Jesus. This is my Texas accent. Jesus was chilling with the homies eating dinner, and this is what he said in Luke 22. He said, But here at this table, sitting among us as a friend, is the man who will betray me. For it has been determined that the Son of Man must die, but what sorrow awaits the one who betrays him? The disciples began to ask each other which of them would ever do such a thing, and they began to argue among themselves about who would be the greatest among them. Have you ever, like, taken the Scripture and read it and then kind of translated it to yourself the way that you would think about it? It's essentially what is happening here. Jesus is going... One of you is going to break the bro code. Unfortunately, not many of the men in here know what the bro code is today. But one of you is going to be a snitch. But you know what? It's all good. It's all good. My life's been determined. My dad's got a plan. I, I just feel bad for that guy because snitches get stitches. It's essentially what Jesus is saying. And it is, <laughs> the disciples are all like, bro, it ain't going to be me. I'm not stupid. I'm not, I'm, man, I, clearly I'm his favorite, not you. I'm better than you. This is their conversation. If God had a plan to sacrifice his own son. We read about that in 1 John 4, verses 10. You think it was right? It seems wrong. Sacrifice his own son, right? It seems absolutely wrong. Let his own son be killed for other people. You think it was right in this story that we just read for Judas to betray Jesus? Absolutely not. It was wrong. That was his friend. He was the Messiah. He is the Messiah. But it was God's plan all along. In Genesis 22, God tested Abraham's faith and told him to take his son and sacrifice him. And the entire way up the mountain, Abraham told only half the truth to to Isaac. I would be a mad son. So God told Abraham to kill his son. Abraham was partially lying. Does that sound right to you? Now, how many of you know that the most potent lies are the ones wrapped in half-truth, or partial truth? In the end, God was glorified, and Abraham became the father of faith and the father of many nations. God had a plan all along, and all it took was for them to have faith and choose to love God, even when it didn't make sense, even when it seemed wrong, even when it would hurt. God has a plan for you, and I'm here to tell you, all he's asking you to do is to choose love because love is always what is right. We need to have faith that where the Spirit leads us is part of God's plan. And when it doesn't make sense, when it seems wrong, when it hurts, we still have to look through the lens of Christ and follow His plan because He has a plan. We just need to love Him and trust Him. So as we end every service, I want you to ask this question to yourselves. What now, God? What now, God? Some of you may be sitting there thinking, man, there are so many things that 
that I do that don't show the love of God first or clearly don't even show the love for people. And I'm standing there right next to you. I tell you, there are times where I get so frustrated or annoyed and so hurt that I, I have to stop and ask for forgiveness for, from God for, for being unloving or for being impatient or being just short-tempered. There are things that have happened in my past that I've clearly done what was wrong without even ever considering what was right. And vice versa, there have been times where I've been faced with decisions that were painful for myself to make, for, for other people that were involved. It was a hard decision, but it had to be done for the right thing to take place. Out of love for him, out of love for his people, out of his love for his plan, I had to follow what God, where God was leading me in that moment. So I want you to do me a favor. Every person in this room, or if you, even if you're watching online or if you're in the lounge, I want, I want to challenge you all today. If you're anything like me, and you're guilty of looking through the lens of the world, and not looking through the lens of Christ, I want you to be bold and stand to your feet right now. I want you to be bold and stand to your feet. If you have ever thought to yourself, man, I could have been more loving in that moment. If you've ever done anything that was not out of love, even in your thoughts, I want you to stand to your feet. I want you to be bold. And I'll tell you, if, if in this moment you're still sitting, quite frankly, you're lying. If, if you have ever been doubting God during any part of this series, many of you... You know, we asked a lot of tough questions and we answered a lot of tough questions. Maybe, maybe these questions got you to thinking and, you, and, and kind of made you mad at times or upset or confused or scared. And you've been fearful of telling others what you believe and what the Bible says. I want you to stand to your feet if that's you. If you have ever found yourself guilty of following a person, essentially idolizing them, simply because the name of their political party or you have ever followed and trusted them over following and trusted the word of God. Stand to your feet. Or maybe you've idolized something else other than God. Many people, you know, often idolize things without realizing it or people without realizing it. We idolize artists, TV shows, movies, stores, words. You know, you can idolize a word. What you... Uh, I'll leave that for another time. But some people idolize pastors and leaders even. It's terrible. Listen, there is always tension in a transition. When you're trying to figure things out, there's tension in that transition. When you are trying to understand or trying to learn something, there's tension in that transition. But once you've heard the truth, the Bible says the truth will set you free. And you can now live freely, serving and loving the Lord with all your heart, all your soul, and all your mind. In 2 Corinthians 3, I love this. Paul says that people's minds were hardened and a veil covers their minds so they cannot uh, understand the truth. But he shares the good news with them right here in verse 16. He says, but whenever someone turns to the Lord, the veil is taken away for the Lord is the spirit. And wherever the spirit of the Lord is, there is freedom. So all of us who have had that veil removed can see and reflect the glory of God. So today, we're going to make a commitment to choose to love and to choose to share the truth, to do what is right even when it seems wrong in the world's eyes, to choose freedom with Christ over being a slave to the world. Listen, I want you to be bold today. I want every person in this room to make this commitment. If you are ready to love God beyond all things and love people selflessly, not selfishly, but selflessly, and to always choose love, whatever that looks like, even when it seems wrong, even when it hurts, even when it's tough. I want you to do me a favor. I want you to be really bold right now and make your way to the front and fill this every bit of space that we have. And once this is filled, fill the aisles. Don't stay in your seat. And the reason why is because I, you have, I want you to make a demonstrated uh, or just in general, just demonstrate your boldness by coming up here to the front right now. Go ahead and come on. You might be thinking, I can't do that. I'm not good enough. I can't go up there. I'm not, I'm not perfect. I have too many flaws. Listen, the Bible says there's no condemnation in Christ. There is always forgiveness in the arms of Christ. Your past is not important. What's important is your next step. What's important is your next step. So no matter what choices you've made, you know, I was listening to a podcast recently and uh, there's a, a ministry that I follow pretty closely. And the pastor that was speaking to them, he was a guest speaker. And the Lord told him, to, he prophesied something to someone in the room. And when I heard this, God said, write that down and say it to your church whenever, for today. Because there's someone in this room or watching online that needs this. And this is what he said. No matter what, 
don't leave me, my child. I still have plans for you. Someone in this room needs to hear that because they're battling something in their mind. They're thinking, whatever happened just doesn't make sense. It's hurtful to those people. It was hurtful to that family. It was hurtful to everyone close to them. It was hurtful to me. You know, it was wrong. Let me tell you, what's wrong in your eyes may not be wrong in God's eyes because he has a plan. And let me tell you something about his plan. His plan will never align itself with what seems right to the world, but not to his word. His plan will never align itself with what seems right to the world, but not to his word. It's our jobs to choose to trust him and love him. So I'm going to pray over you all right now, wherever you are at in this room, in the aisles and in the front. I want you to do me a favor and lift your arms up as a sign of surrender. You know, when we do this, we're, we're putting ourselves out there into a position of vulnerability and surrendering all to Christ. So I'm going to pray over you, and then I want you to do me a favor and stay right where you're at and worship. I want you to do that for me. Father, we are here today to make a stand for what is right through your eyes. We commit to searching and living through the lens of the word, of your word, not this world's view or by what our culture says. We will search you and search your word for what is righteous. God, we ask for forgiveness. We ask for strength moving forward. We choose you. We choose to love you. We choose to love your people and to trust you. God, we will speak your truth with love and with boldness and declare the goodness of God everywhere that we go every day of our lives. And we will worship you with everything we are and everything we have. In Jesus' name, and the church said amen. Well, we are so thankful for the truth that was shared in this message today. Please know that we, as a church, are praying that what you have learned today, the truths that God has put deep into your heart, will manifest themselves and grow themselves into something amazing. And as always, you can experience that with other believers, other people who are walking this walk of faith at ACC on Sunday mornings at 9 and 11 a.m. Please remember this. You belong at ACC.